You're listening to Snyder & Associates webinar series, a civil engineering planning and design firm focused on thinking beyond engineering to improve quality of life within the communities we serve. This episode's host is Wes Farron. Today we're talking about sewer system maintenance. I know it's an exciting topic and hopefully it'll be interesting, informative and useful to everybody that's listening. As a water resources engineer, when people ask me what I do, I don't like to get into too much of the details. I often tell them that I study and design things that most people take for granted until they break. And sewer systems are a prime example that illustrates that somewhat cheeky response. There's various ways to approach maintaining these unseen sewer systems, but one we're gonna talk about today is a risk-based method. This is a methodology for determining the most economical use of maintenance resources based on risk. It's commonly referred to as RBM. It's not our invention. It's out there. There's books on it everywhere. It's not necessarily restricted to sewers. It's used in a lot of different industries. But basically, it breaks down to a risk assessment of what you have and then planning your maintenance or what you're going to do on that risk. Obviously, most people would understand there's not enough resources to do everything. You can't build a new sewer system every time something breaks. The challenge we face in almost every case is to allocate limited resources in some manner. And what we're talking about today is allocating those resources based on our risk exposure. The objectives that we're looking at today is why it's important to maintain your sewers, predicting failures in the sewer system, how to stack the deck in your favor when it comes to those failures or potential failures, with the ultimate goal to assess and reduce risk and risk exposure, and then to use that to plan for the future. Sanitary sewers, a quick background, I'm sure probably all of us know, but it's important to the principle of the risk management topic. Sewers are a sole conveyance. They are the critical path from the user's homes to the treatment plant. There's no other way that the wastewater is getting to the treatment plant. And there's a quality of life expectation to that uninterrupted function. When people flush, they expect it to disappear. There's no halfway point there. And then the nature of sewers, they're out of sight. So they're easily forgotten. They're easily taken for granted. I joke that some of my best work will never be seen again once that trench is backfilled. But a failure in that system becomes very visible very quickly as a number one priority. What happens if we don't maintain our sewers? Everything from the relatively minor reduction in capacity, blockages, collapsed pipes can eventually occur. All that can lead to basement backups, flooding, home damages. You can get sinkholes in the grade and roadways above the sewer. Environmental damages that can come from overflows to adjacent creeks and streams. Emergency situations like that can domino into much greater impacts. And there's also a negative public image. You can do 99% great work, but one failure in public confidence in the infrastructure is seriously damaged. Because with many things in life, the cost of reactive repairs in this area is typically much greater than proactive repairs. The age old adage of a stitch in time is very applicable to sewer maintenance. Some examples of what we're talking about. The good, this is a sanitary sewer that's in relatively good condition. It's not a new sewer, it's an older clay pipe sewer, but it's solid, it's functioning well. It's got a break in tap, but there's no major I and I observed coming from it. There's no cracks in the pipe, no roots creeping into the joint. All in all, this is what a lot of communities would wish to see. The bad. This is a sewer that has been forgotten about and not maintained. The window for the stitch in time has long since passed. When we televised this line, the camera got to that void. You can kind of see on the right up there. It panned right and looked into a room that the crawler could have turned into and took a nap over there. The flow line's gone. The wastewater here is flowing directly on dirt. And it's probably not going to be long before this results in something major, such as the ugly. This is where the unseen now becomes seen with major damages that are gonna cost major money. This is not our picture, thankfully, but it's a representation of the worst that could happen. A quick story of a near miss of something like this in the photo. We had a recent storm sewer project where we were constructing storm sewer adjacent to an existing sanitary sewer, and we had a trench wall collapse. The unique thing about this trench wall collapse was that the trench wall didn't fall into the trench, it fell out of the trench. It exposed a void over the top of the sewer next to our storm sewer that a man could have walked into without any difficulty, all directly below a well-traveled residential street. We dodged a bullet on that one, thankfully discovered it, was able to repair it, but it could have easily turned into something like this had it gone longer. Now that we've seen some examples of failures, we'll talk a bit about what causes them. Sanitary sewers are progressively decaying from the day we put them in the ground. Every sewer is different based on conditions, the pipe material, the type, but they are a decaying asset. They're never gonna be as shiny and clean as the day you put them in. Many systems, especially in our region of the country, are reaching the end of that useful life. Old clay pipes that were put in in the 40s, 50s, and 60s 
those are getting to be 60, 70 years old now. And while they're quality product, they're starting to show their age. Over time, they will decay and they are decaying. The important takeaway is that we need to be aware of those deterioration causes so that we can plan accordingly. One of the biggest causes of deterioration in our sewers is hydrogen sulfide, either directly emanating from the wastewater or compounded by microbial induced corrosion. Mike is this known, which is the bacteria that grow on the pipe walls that increase the corrosion. Industrial chemicals can also cause corrosion in our pipes, things we don't know are getting flushed. The picture on the left here shows a cast iron gate or what was a cast iron gate. It's more of a rust gate now. This is on a recent project where the hydrogen sulfide has corroded the iron in that gate and it pretty much just crumbles in your hand. The picture on the right is a little bit more difficult, but you can kind of see the circumference of the pipe. It kind of looks like a mushroom. That shows where the normal water level of the pipe was and where it's expanded out on the upper portion of the pipe is where the corrosion of the pipe has lost about two inches of wall thickness, exposed all the rebar in that concrete pipe. This is actually after the lining, but it illustrates how that pipe wall disappears and the corrosion that hydrogen sulfide can cause. The pipe, traffic loadings, especially for shallow pipes, the natural freeze-thaw cycle, soil movements, erosion or cavitation of the flow in the pipe can cause movements and anytime something moves, especially with old clay pipes that don't like to move, it can result in cracks that eventually turn into collapsed sewers. Damages even from installation errors that harm the integrity of the pipe, break-in taps can damage pipe. Other utilities, the picture on the left shows a gas line that was bored right through the top of a sewer pipe. Adjacent construction, even cleaning can cause damage to a pipe if you've got a sewer that has a lot of roots that are cleaned often. The equipment that cleans those roots can damage the inside of the pipe over time. And there's a lot of other things that who knows what will run into. Material decay, iron pipes can have stray electrical currents that can cause corrosion, it's organic and inorganic deposits, root intrusions, or just a combination of everything above. The most unique that we found was a picture on the right there. You can see a bunch of rebar and debris and stuff hanging down into the pipe. And when we did our investigation on what the cause of this was, we discovered that this location was directly below a piling for a bridge abutment that passed above it. When they put in the bridge, they drove the pile and it broke through the top of the pipe, caused all the damage and was presenting a blockage risk. Where's your next failure going to be? You know, you can get this crystal ball on Amazon for 45 bucks. It's got five star reviews and maybe that'll work. Say it does work. What will the impacts of that failure be? Is that under a main street in town? Is it going to be a abutment of a bridge? Are people going to get sewer backups? Is it going to discharge into a waterway? Thinking about all those potential situations really puts the importance of proper sewer maintenance into perspective. But we know the crystal ball is not going to work. We can't predict the failures, but there are ways that we can stack the deck in our favor. Risk by definition is being exposed to danger, harm, or loss. How does that relate to sewers? Well, a pipe failure is a loss, right? So we want to reduce our risk of having a pipe failure because a pipe failure in a high risk sewer is going to be accompanied by a large price tag. Emergency repairs are always the most expensive kind. Knowing where those high risk locations exist is key, but to know that you have to know your system. It's important to have a baseline of your system health, which ties back to knowing where the good and bad areas are. A lot of operators, they're gonna know in general where the good and bad areas of town are, and that's very useful information. It's important though, however, to get a little bit more detailed on the data to use a risk management system so that you can apply it objectively to all parts of the system. Data is the most important thing to know your system. You may not know you have an issue in an area unless you get data on it. And that's combined with looking at manholes, looking at sewer mains and other key facilities, siphon crossing, pump stations, anything in the system that's critical to conveying that flow. For example, on a recent large diameter sewer assessment project, the client invested significant capital in inspecting about 900 structures and over 60 miles of gravity, force main, and siphon work. Three phases of work over several years, but it was an important investment to them that paid off in the end. This is the extent of all those sewers that were looked at, basically everything in their system built before 2004. They had limited resources to rehab problem areas. How do you pick where the problem area is in a system that big? Well, we started with manhole assessment. Those are the easiest things to see because you can pop the lid and look down them. That's really what it is. It's a visual inspection, inspecting the interior. We always recommend using a NASCO, National Association of Sewer Companies, MACP, Manhole Assessment Certification Program. Basically, it's a standardized format for determining what damages are and the severity of those damages. 
On that recent project, we only located about 661 of the 900 manholes, but we did an interior assessment of all those different manholes, looking at structural and I and I components, categorized them in that matrix that you can see there of the scoring condition. Then the next step was to go into sewer main inspections. Now, this really should be a regular inspection program. Unfortunately, that's hard to do. It takes some capital, but it's important to document the condition of the sewer and conditions can change. Sewer videos from 10 years ago may not be representative of what is in there today. It's important to do a regular if you can, at least of problem areas, and then a document so that comparison can be made from the last time. A couple different technologies that are out there for doing the sewer main inspection, acoustic inspection, smoke testing, closed circuit, and then a new one that we used on the large diameter project here recently was a multi-sensor, and I'll talk about that here in a minute too. Acoustic is a relatively new technology, it uses sound waves to indicate potential blockages or potential issues. We haven't used it a whole lot, but its best application is for preliminary inspection. When you have a large quantity of sewers that need to be looked at, not enough financial resources to do them all, this is a little bit more cost-effective way to maybe identify those sewers that need to be looked at closer. Smoke testing can identify public and private defects, illicit connections, I and I sources. It can be a gauge of leakiness. It's not foolproof, but when you see smoke, you know there's a connection and an issue. CCTV is a closed caption televising. That's the most commonly used and it is the most useful. Obviously, if you can see it, it's much better than any other data for the most part. It's a visual understanding and record of what the sewer looks like. NASCO PACP coding is again, another standardized system for coding damages and their severity of the damages. Then it usually results in a video and a report that can be used then as a basis for your data and doing your risk assessment. Multi-sensor inspection is the one I mentioned before. It's a kind of a new technology applied mostly towards large diameter sewers. It's a floating platform where you can't take the sewer out of service. It takes high definition, closed caption television for everything above the water surface, kind of like a Google Streets for the inside of your sewer, if you will. It collects LIDAR data for determining the loss of pipe wall. If it's supposed to be a 78 inch pipe, it'll measure. And if it's an 82 inch pipe, you know, you've lost two inches of wall thickness around it. It has a laser for measuring ovality if there's any squashing of the pipe due to overburden. And it takes sonar data for everything below the water level, which is an estimate of sediment volumes, debris, and the damages below the water level. This is an example of the MSI output. It's uh, very data heavy. You can see on the right shows the wall loss in the, the yellow has a rollout view that shows the whole pipe all at once. Then you can see on the left, the video, and this plays as a real time data. Very, very, very handy for these large diameter sewers. On our example project, we did MSI or CCTV inspection for about 57 miles of gravity sewer, whole bunch of force main, whole bunch of siphon pipe. The small diameter stuff was more typical assessment, but there was a lot of data that came with that. The question is what inspection to use? Well, it's gonna be unique to each system. You have small diameter pipes, you have large diameter pipes. That's gonna drive what technology is most worthwhile to you. Also your goals. Is your goal just to look at the structural integrity of the sewer, I and I, inflow and infiltration, the reduced capacity of sewers, or as most likely is the case, is it a combination of those things? But there can be other goals too. So that can drive what inspection you wanna to use to get the data for your system. So you've collected data, what are you gonna do with it all? We could just stuff it in a filing cabinet like the picture shows there. And honestly, that's not uncommon in a lot of areas, unfortunately. Maybe even the person that's filing that has a method of their madness, but they may not always be there. And it really isn't useful in doing a risk assessment process. But it's important to have data management that's done on purpose, stored in a common location, usually electronically on a server, stored in a usable format. VHS tapes of 20 years ago aren't very useful today. So having it in an electronic format that's usable and then have a system that's planned and set up before you collect your data. It'll be much easier down the road to put that data in and keep it where it should be. You're gonna spend good money on your data, protect it with good data management practices. Asset management is very similar to data management, but it kind of takes it a step further. This includes not just the data for the assets, but knowing where those assets are at, details about them, and the ability to view and review that information whenever and wherever. Really the backbone of an effective asset management program is a GIS system. For those in the audience that may be unfamiliar with GIS, quick overview, it's a database combined with spatial location data. As you can see in the visual there, it's a sewer line. You can click on any of the data points. It'll show you what it is, is a manhole, different data fields, elevations, 
a customization of those data fields is infinite. Put whatever information you want in there. It's very useful to manage all the data that you collect on your system and have it easily accessible. So we've got our data. What repairs are needed now? This is really the big question when we talk about prioritizing and limited resources for sewer maintenance. Doing an evaluation on that collected information through a risk assessment is one way to do that. With the primary goal to reduce our exposure, we need to figure out which assets are high risk. Risk assessment when it comes to sewer maintenance. It's a scoring method that identifies weak points of a sewer network, kind of through a matrix that assigns weights to different priority criteria. The components of this are the likelihood of failure, which is basically the condition of the asset or the pipe itself, but also the consequence of the failure. And that really is what makes it a component a risk assessment more than just a condition assessment. The likelihood of failure is the asset's physical condition. This is mostly based on that raw inspection data. Here we're talking about televising data, the LIDAR data, sonar data, whatever you get. PACP coding, this is where that standardized defect code is very handy. It makes it a little bit more subjective. And that data can be provided in a database format that can be easily manipulated electronically rather than manually. In this case here, we've got PACP ratings on the left, which kind of goes into the overall pipe rating. We also added in some pipe wall loss characteristics, the corrosion volume, the sediment volume on the bottom all combined into a one to five rating system where five is the worst condition of likelihood of failure. We take the raw data and we assign a weighting criteria up to 100% of what is our highest priority. In this case, the overall pipe rating was 70% of the criteria. The corrosion volume or how much pipe wall loss there'd been was 30% of it. The client in particular for this one didn't have much concern with the sediment volume, so it was assigned to zero. This is customizable. You can make this whatever we want. We can add in different components in this matrix, but basically it, it weights all these matrices and spits out our likelihood of failure rating at the end of the day. So we could just stop there. That's the physical condition. Those are gonna be your worst pipes. The ones with the highest likelihood of failure, they're gonna be the ones that need to be fixed. However, there's also financial limitations and there may be pipes with equal likelihood of failure. Which one do you pick? So this is where the risk exposure comes in. And this considers the system impacts as another factor to that risk, which is the consequence of failure. It's on a very similar one to five scoring as the likelihood of failure. This one is also customizable for different uh, consequences of failure. The project we've been talking about identified one factor as critical crossings. Is it crossing a waterway? Is it underneath a bridge? Is it an arterial roadway? That would be a major issue if it failed. How big is the pipe? Which kind of relates to how many people does it serve? You know, if it went down, how many people are affected by that pipe not being in service? The depth of the pipe, that factors into the constructability or the effort it would take to get down to it to do a fix on our emergency repair. The land use that's over top of it, you know, is it in a residential area or is it out in the middle of a farm field? That way to factor. So as an example of how this applies, we've got two different pipe photos here. The one on the left, pipe A, you can see the rebar from the concrete pipe starting to corrugate the wall of the pipe, which shows that you've lost about two inches of pipe wall thickness. Pipe B, you're not seeing that rebar poking through yet, but there has been pipe wall thickness in this one. By likelihood of failure or condition, pipe A would seem to be the one to address. However, when you take a look at where it is at in the world, pipe A is out in a remote area, maybe not easily accessible, but much different impact than if pipe B had a catastrophic failure, which is directly underneath a major roadway, one of the few bridges to cross the river in this area, the impacts to the street and the construction costs to do a major repair there would be significantly higher than pipe A would be. The risk factor weighs both of those in its assessment. Example two, this is more on a smaller level. This process is scalable. We used it primarily on this recent project for a large diameter sewer system, but it could also be scaled down and used on a smaller system as well. Here you've got red sewers that were identified as high risk. You've got some that are underneath the major roadway interchange to the north there. Then you've got others that are just a small diameter line that just serves a small portion of a neighborhood. They may have the same condition. If you have limited funds, it helps to have this assessment to allocate those funds to the most useful area. Maintenance planning is the next step. We have the risk assessment where we've identified the riskiest or the potential highest risk segments. And so we're going to develop a program that addresses those using that risk information. So this is going to be based on the calculated risk, which is the product of the likelihood of failure and the consequence of failure, with obviously the high risk assets addressed and repaired first. In our case study, we had about 20% of the inspected sewers classified as higher 
to highest risk. You can see that on this risk rating curve where the risk of the pipe was put on a chart. There's fewer of them, but you can see them on the left of that chart. The vast majority of the sewer system is pretty decent conditions, but identifies where those riskiest pipes are. We know that if we're going to apply limited dollars to our maintenance, we need to apply them in those segments that are on the left of that curve. It's not just as easy as picking off those segments though. The next step to using your money wisely is to visualize those priority areas. This is where the GIS comes in very handy. We take data from the GIS. I call it the little black box. We run it through the matrices of the likelihood of failure, consequence of failure. It kicks out a rating and we take that rating and we put it back into GIS and apply it to the segments with a color coding so we can easily see in an area what the risk rating of those sewers are. And this can be used then to stage your projects. As you can see there, the red is the high priority risk sewers. Pretty easy to pick out which ones we need to address, but there's also some segments of orange that's in the middle there. Now those sewers weren't as bad a condition. However, if you're gonna be staging a project, if you're already gonna be lining or rehabilitating the sewer on either side of that orange section, it's most cost effective to address that segment when you're doing the others around it than to have to come back with a separate project and remobilize into that area and address it at that time. You can kind of break up a reasonable project based on visualizing the extent of that on a map. So here's the project sewer risk map. This is all the 60 miles of sewers with their risk rating overlaid onto them. And you can see that it really kicks out some areas pretty quick as low priority. Those newer sewers on the upper reaches, that would make sense. The older sewer down through the main part of the older part of town, we would expect to have a higher rating. And that's what we're seeing. But there are some outliers that are high risk that would make sense in other areas to address as well. So visualizing on the map really helps to break that down. So in our case, it was identified to do two phases of rehab, 78 inch and 90 inch sewer, totaling about $13 million estimated cost, breaking that down into two phases. Again, the detail of this, you're getting down into, okay, phasing the construction. We know where we wanna go. Now we gotta figure out bypassing requirements. This one was driven mostly by bypassing. Can't ask half the town to not flush. So you gotta be able to bypass the sewer overlaying those risk ratings on the sewer with the visualization of where those are at and then applying it to the unique conditions of each system ultimately ends up in that planned project. So here you can see the sewer rehabilitation curve with the orange and the red as those first two segments as the priority segments that are gonna be addressed. It addresses a vast majority of those on that high end of the curve. It doesn't get them all, you'll notice. Those are outliers that didn't fit into that staging area. But once these red and orange are addressed, they fall down onto the flatter leg of the curve because they've been rehabilitated. And then the next phase of rehabilitation will address those that are now on the high end of that curve. Which leads us into the next step, which is the budget forecasting. This is the capital improvement planning portion and where this information can really be beneficial in that CIP process. We know we have limited funds, we can't do it all. You can take that curve and assign some dollars to those different segments and widen that box on the left until you maximize the dollars that you have available. Put the money that's available towards the highest risk assets first. And it's a very good guidance tool. Anybody, financial advisors or the accountants can see very easily on what we're doing and that we're using our limited money to the most effective means. On the example project, that was about 60,000 feet of sewer that was flagged as high risk. We broke that down into an eight year program of about 7,500 feet per year, budgeting about $5 million per year to address all of that so that after eight years of that program, all those high risk assets would be addressed and rehabilitated. Plotting that on the chart, we were able to show that, all right, the current CIP had about $25 million, $27 million allocated to it, but to get that full eight-year program was going to take about $45 million. This is a very useful tool then to take to the financial planning aspect of it to show, hey, if we're capped at $25 million, we're only going to be able to address this number of sewers. If we want to address it all, we're going to need to increase our funding or reallocate funding from elsewhere, as the case may be. So it's a useful tool then at the end to help explain financial needs so that here in the example projects case, they were able to take this to their finance committee, explain what they did, the data to back it up, and were able to justify additional CIP funds that were going to be allocated in future CIP planning to be able to do the remainder of the high-risk asset sewers. So our goal of cost savings of proactive maintenance, it's always important. Knowing your system, getting that baseline knowledge of your sewer with data that you can use to manage purpose with a plan, and then using that risk assessment method to stack the deck in your favor to reduce your risk exposure. If 
but also to apply your limited rehabilitation funds in the most cost-effective manner. Thanks for the opportunity to share today. Hopefully it's interesting, or at least maybe an idea that could be applied to an area in your community. Again, it's not restricted to sewers. It could be applied to roadways. It could be scaled up to large systems, to small systems. The RBM isn't our idea. There's lots of books on the topic, but it is an idea that has worked very well on several projects, especially when you're taking a monumental undertaking, like the example project of 60 miles of sewer, to get your head around that, break it down into manageable pieces, data, objective data-based that outputs usable results and eventually produces a good plan for moving forward that avoids that ugly, if at all possible. Thank you for listening to Snyder & Associates webinar series, a civil engineering, planning and design firm focused on thinking beyond engineering to improve quality of life within the communities we serve. Find content related to this episode on snyder-associates.com.